Thank you, Robert. I appreciate it. Hi, everybody. Hello. Thank you for the weather to come in today to join us. I appreciate it. And thank you to everybody who's joining us online. Uh, we have a really right good there. turnout. So great to see you all. Oh, yeah, you're up there. Hello. <laughs> I'm looking at you here, but you're up there. Hello. Um, so today we have local attorney Andrea Shoup from Shoup Legal. She's here to discuss a topic that is so important, especially for real estate agents to be educated on, and that's probate. Uh, if you're not familiar with probate, it's the legal process to distribute a deceased person's assets and settle their debts. And if you work with clients who are dealing with probate, you already know that it can be a very complex and challenging process, and it requires expert guidance and support. So the more educated you can be on this topic, the better service you can provide to your clients. Um, before we get started, I just wanted to share some local stats about our Marietta property. Um, in all of Marietta, there are a total of 38,203 single family residences and condos. Okay. Only 5,144 properties are vested in a trust. That means that 33,059 properties are not vested in a trust. That means 87% of the properties here in Marietta are not currently held in a trust. And as you guys know, a trust is the best way to protect your assets and to protect your, your family from having to go through this probate process, right? Yes. Out of that 33,000, 913 owners have 50% equity in their property. So it's a lot of assets that they're sitting on. And out of that 9,613, 4,503 owners are 55 years or older. So those are the owners that really need to be educated on this and know that this is the best way to protect those assets and to protect their families from having to go through probate and save thousands of dollars, right? Andrea's gonna go more into the, the costs that are involved. But um, I'm really happy that you're all here and wanting to become more educated on this topic. So without any further ado, I'm gonna hand it off to Andrea. Thank you. Thank you so much, Julie. I appreciate it. Hi. Hi. Awesome. Thank you for coming out and learning about probate. So, of course, it's something that's near and dear to my heart. Um, and I love those statistics. Um, when she shared those with me, I'm like, wow, that's great. That's, you know, 4,500 households here in Marietta alone don't have their property in a trust, are over 55 years of age, and have over 50% of equity in their home. Like, talk about opportunity, yeah. right? Opportunity to help people. And so that's really what I appreciate doing, is being able to bring value and help others. Because when we're able to provide value, figure out what people need and provide that value to them, I think that's just like what makes the world go round. And that makes, you know, the more value we can, we give out, the more value that comes back to us in return. So I'm going to be talking about the ins and eights outs of probate sales, really talking about what to do when a property owner passes away and really what, what you need to know about that. So today, what you're going to discover is uh, what to do when a property owner dies, the oops, probate, you know, what you need to know about that, the difference between a will and a trust, how, um, estate planning actually saves money and saves uh, money for your clients and how to provide more value to your clients. And so really this is for you if you are, sorry, um, if you are a realtor in Southern California, if you are sick and tired of getting wrong information and you want to learn more about real estate probate transactions, all right? So, um, and also if you're interested in providing that value to your clients, again, um, you'll hear me talking about that all throughout um, our time together. I'm always looking for a way, what can I do to help? How can I add value? Um, and if we come from it from that perspective, um, it just, it makes everybody involved just that much better. So who am I? Uh, Julie introduced me. My name's Andrea Shoup. I am an estate planning attorney. I have an office here in Marietta. And I really got into estate planning and understood the value of estate planning when I was working in San Diego, I was working for the district attorney's office. And I was a felony trial prosecutor and I saw real life happen to people every day, the unexpected. And I saw kids going into foster care, into government care. And I saw families just drug through these year long process and it was awful. And I knew that there had to be a better way because at that time I was expecting my first son, Matthew. 
And I thought, well, what happens if my husband doesn't come home from that deployment? What happens if I'm in a car accident? What do we do to protect our baby? What do we need to put into place to protect ourselves? And now I have four little ones at home. Uh, I am more passionate than ever to making sure that families have the information that they need so that they can protect themselves. Because when families have to go through this process, so whenever someone passes away, it's an awful time. Like it's, it's just awful no matter what. That part of it, that's bad enough. Now let's keep on everything else and it's like the second tragedy of probate and court and uncertainty and legal battles and all the mess no thank you you know what let you know death is a part of life it's just part of it let families go through that part of it without the rest of it and whatever i can do to help families get that and avoid that for themselves that's what i want to do so um and that's what i believe i think you guys are in the perfect situation to help your clients out I mean, those statistics are amazing. How many times have you gone through a transaction and it wasn't in a trust, right? Most of the time, right? Most of the time it isn't. I think from the statistics, only 13% of houses are in a trust in Marietta. Yikes. I I told Julie, I'm like, can you help me get that list? Um, You know, because there's so many people that we can help, but you guys are in the perfect position to help people out because you're helping people really buy and invest in one of their biggest investments, right? Their home. And now if I ask any of you, I'm, I'm sure you, you tell me, well, yeah, of course I want to help my clients protect their home. Who doesn't want to help your clients protect their home? Right. You know, I I don't see any, you know, like jerks in the back, right? You know, (laughs) of course we do. So what can we do? How can we help them? Well, you know what? We can become educated ourselves. And in turn, we can educate others because I have found most people don't understand what happens. They don't know it. I was helping a lady. um, She's actually a real estate agent. And unfortunately, um, her husband recently passed away. How many times have you seen it where only husband's name is on the deed? Mm. All the time, right? Yeah. Let me tell you what happens when that happens. Wife now has to, not only does she have to go to court to get that house, but a lot of times she has to share half of it with somebody else. Just imagine that. That's awful. And so when I I was talking with my client, I told her about it. She's like, wait, what? She's like, I was in real estate. I should have known this. I, how did I not know that this was the case? So that's what I want to do. I want to educate you so that you in turn can educate your clients. And to me, if we can help one person, one family, not have that happen to them, I feel like we've, we've done a good thing. So um, as we, um, I want to talk about what do we do? What happens when a property owner dies? Okay. So there's a few different things depending on, I'll tell you one of the most important things you got to do you got to pull title early and often. Okay. It is so important because the first thing, you know, whenever you're looking at a a property, you've got to understand who owns it because that's one of our first um, questions. So pull title early and often. I will say I am always impressed with um, title companies who care about their agents to bring them this information. And I'm guessing now, Julie, I'm going to put you on the spot. I'm guessing if somebody emailed you and said, Hey, I need to know who's on title of this property. Is that something you could help them out with? Absolutely. Is that something you would love to be able to help them out with? <laughs> a thousand times, yes. <laughs> because I'm sure you see the aftermath of it, right? You see it where, I mean, how many times have you been, you know, wor- working with someone and they're like, oh yeah, mom's sick. Oh yeah, mom passed away. <laughs> but don't worry, I'm her daughter. I can de- deal with it. Eh, not all the time. Yeah, exactly. You had that happen. It's not automatic. It's not necessarily true. You've got to pull title early and often um, to make sure that you know you get your preliminary title report. You understand who you're dealing with and how title is vested because that makes a difference along the way. Got to make sure that you understand it. You have great partners here that are going to be able to help you and support you with that. I'm sorry. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Okay. So the first situation is if it's held in a trust, if it's held in a trust and yes, I will tell you, this is like the best way to hold it because it's the most protection. It's actually very simple. If it's held in a trust and that person passes away, we have to complete and record something called an app. Affidavit change of trustee. Sorry, I, mean, I have my the keyboard. I'm used to a clicker, so forgive me if it's a if I have to catch up with that. So it's an affidavit change of trustee. It's actually pretty simple. 
that gets completed, it gets uh, recorded with the death certificate and it gets recorded. And then it's pretty darn simple. You, uh, once that's recorded, you submit that and the in the trust document to the title company. And there you go. You, the person that, who's the successor trustee can sell the property. So that's why it's important that you know, oh, this is held in a trust. Hey, I need a copy of that trust document. Hey, I need to know who that successor trustee is. Do yourself and your clients a favor. Ask those questions on the front end. Don't wait to three days before closing is supposed to happen. That's not the time to ask Julie, like, hey, so what do we got to do? Let's figure that out on the front end because it saves so much, so much in hassles. Um, if I can chime in on please. that, really one of the first things that a lot of our clients, as Karen knows, as soon as you get that listing agreement, um, let us know right away and we'll get a listing prelim open for you. You don't have to wait until escrow is open to get this listing prelim. And the benefit of doing that is that it's going to take a couple of days for that prelim to come in. But once it does, I do a full prelim review. And one of the first things that we go over is how title is held. And then if there are any clouds, we'll address it right then and there. So we can address a lot of these issues before escrow is open. Yeah. Solar, liens, judgments, modifications, all those things we can start working on before you guys get your buyers. Right on. Correct. Yeah. Correct. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and which is a great, I mean, it's a great resource that you have available to you. Use it. Utilize it. Okay. So, um, what happens when a property owner dies and it's in joint tenancy? Joint tenancy is actually a really special way to hold title. It includes with it an automatic right of survivorship. So with that, so if you have two people, we have Bob and we have Fred. If Bob apps, um, unfortunately passes away, <laughs> by operation of law, Fred becomes the new owner. To reflect that, you have to complete the affidavit de death of, affidavit death of uh, joint tenant record that with the death certificate, have that recorded, and now Fred can completely transact on that property. Okay, it makes it very simple. You said, um, so joint tenant- Joint tenants, uh-huh. Tenants has an automatic right, right of survivorship. survivorship. Okay. Yep, it's automatic, by, it's just by operation of law. Okay, so if it was three people on title, yep. so it would just revert to the two. The two, and now they're 50-50. Got it. Yep. Tenants in common. So this is not an automatic right of survivorship. This is, let's say back to Bob and Fred, if Bob passes away, it does not automatically go to Fred, okay? This is the default, whether it says tenants in common or it says nothing. This is the same if it was Fred and Wilma, if it's husband and wife, okay? No automatic right of survivorship. It matters what title says, that's why full title early and often just because, okay, Bob and Fred, Bob passed away, we're good. No, because a, a lot of times it'll just default to this tenants in common. Tenants in common is a default when nothing else is said on the deed and there's no automatic succession to it. No automatic right of survivorship. It's now as if it was in Bob's individual name. Okay. And we, I'm going to talk about it, but when it's in somebody's individual name, that's not good. And let me tell you why. If, if the property is in Bob's individual name, what happens when we transfer property? What do we What do we need? We need to sign a. Starts with a D, ends with a D. D, right? We need to sign a deed. Well, Bob's not there to sign the deed because he's passed away. Who's there to sign the deed? I. Yeah. No one. Court. Yeah, court. Both right, government and court, right? One and the same. Judge, court order. Exactly. You need to have a court order. Okay. So when it's in somebody's individual name, then there's no one there to sign that deed. And unfortunately, we're in probate court. Okay. Probate is a court process, it's the procedure for transferring assets from one person to someone else after that person's passed away. Anytime I tell you, you have to go to court, just think it's going to take a long time and it's going to cost a lot of money. I've spent 17 years in court. Nothing good happens in court. We want to stay out of court. All right. But um, it's with the probate process, it's a very lengthy process. On average, most probates take about two years to complete. Mm -hmm. And that's when nobody's fighting nobody's contesting, everybody's getting along and basically doing their job. 
Um, I had to file something in, I think it was in San Bernardino County in probate court. We filed it in August. I got a court hearing date in May. That's how long it takes just to get into, just to have the hearing heard. It takes a long time. Um, it's a public process. Everything that happens in court is public record and open to the public. And it's also a very costly process. Probate fees are determined based on the gross estate value. When I say gross estate value, I mean how much something could be sold for, right? It's the listing price of the house. We don't even look at the mortgage. So just think of a fairly modest um, estate of $500,000. Think of a modest home, sure. modest personal property, modest retirement accounts. Probate fees exceed $26,000. Yeah. So, and, and how much does it cost to have a trust put together for you? Oh, goodness. A, a comprehensive trust probably is about four or $5,000. So four or $5,000 worth saving we're twenty grand. I mean, yeah, I think. But what if you have multiple properties? Then they go into the trust too. They get yeah. transferred into the trust. As far as it's a, it all varies. Okay, it, it's all it all varies based on complexity, okay. but also this is just probate fees, mm -hmm. I, and it's beyond what I'm able to talk about too. But that doesn't um, count conservatorship costs. Oh, yeah, that doesn't count when um, you know we have two brothers and they're both like, I want to be in charge of dad's estate, and now we're fighting. Or even if it's not like full on fighting, but we're disagreeing a little bit and we're like, we'll just let the judge decide. Anytime we want the judge to decide something, just think it's going to cost at least 50, 60, $70,000. It's expensive, and, you guys. And that's another thing. You have clients have multiple properties or multiple heirs with kids mm -hmm. and stuff like that. You want to sit down with somebody like her because if you go to a generic place who's going to charge you a thousand bucks to put it together, they could misword something by putting and instead of or yep and that'll sit there and make the whole thing void yep and you won't even be able to use it yep so that's the thing the verbiage on these things are very specific and that's why you want to work with an attorney like her when i'm sure you guys see it all the time well, we right no 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 and that's like i mean I, I remember dealing with one of karen's way back in the day where all of a sudden <laughs> these guys because hey when a property's right. in a trust what are some things that it might get pulled out of the trust for what would happen Refinance. Uh, so, so when people refinance, <laughs> lenders don't like to sit there and keep it in a trust name. They don't like to lend to a trust. So therefore they have to put it in their own identity and then they do the loan, but they always forget to put it back in the trust. Yep. And that was when I had to deal with dirt. We had to sit there and get an attorney involved who put together the trust and acknowledge it's the same people and everything else. And then we were able to sit there and accept it. But you got to remember, after refinances, they need to put it back into their trust. Yep. Okay, so that's one, I mean, that's one thing. Like, I mean, a lot of these people in Julie's stacks, they might have already had a trust, but they're not in it right now because they forgot. They took advantage of those rates two years ago and yep. forgot it to put it back in their trust. Oh, yep. so, so yeah. And I'll just tell you what a great opportunity. Think of how many clients you have who probably did that. Get on the phone with them. Just call them to see how things are going reason to connect with your previous client completely we um in in my office we call them gas calls i'll, I'll censor myself give a care calls right tell them you give a care <laughs> right tell them you care about them like say hey how are things going what's going on with you hey i just want to make sure you know rates were really low did you refinance just make sure that house got back into your trust uh -huh. so if you have anybody like that what a great way to reconnect and become top of mind um again and if you don't have it in a trust, we have a phone number for you. That was not nice. <laughs> All right. Mm, I have a I have a question. It's my heart it does. Yeah. We have a we have a question on Zoom. Go ahead. Yeah, the not this one, but like two slides back. Uh, you say that that what when you say what's probate, you say it's court process, lengthy, costly, and what was the other one? Because I you public, you, it's public, it's public. All public record. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. And what I mean by that is we have to file something in court. It's called an inventory and appraisal. That inventory lists everybody's assets. So you know everyone's assets, including you know all their personal property, all their banking information, their where they bank. Bank account, uh, bank account numbers, 
bank account balances, it's all public record. Somebody, somebody's mm. like, we'll keep that private, right? Unfortunately, oh, wow. when you go through this, it's all public. Yeah. So, and you say, um, I'm sorry, you go to that. Okay, so you say inventory, it's all assets, and what was the other one? Inventory and appraisal. Appraisal, okay, yep. thank you. So, probate occurs when you have any real property. You have to go to probate court whenever you have any real property. That could be a multi million dollar estate, it could be a lot in the Salton Sea. We're in probate court if you have any real property. Hi. Also, if your assets are above $184,500. I know that's a really specific number. That's because that's what's in the probate code. And so that's when you have to go to probate court if any of these two occur. And those are ors, okay? They're not ands, they're ors. All right. When a full probate is needed, there really is no avoiding it. I mean, with title, right? If if you see it, you're like, sorry, a probate's needed. Is there any like workarounds or anything like that? No, I would say, I mean, and that's the thing. Uh, a lot of times people consider a will is the same thing as like as a trust that it's not. A trust is the new wills. Like if you're gonna go sit down with an attorney and put it together a specific will, might as well do a trust because you're gonna protect everything. Yeah. And that's where we see a trust. Yeah, it's easy street. It's we can sit there and do the transaction. Once I see, uh, I mean, there's no trust and it's in someone's name, married, joint tenants, whatever it is, it has to go through probing. Yep. There's no, I mean, even if they have a will that just got put together by an attorney, it still has to go through probing. What if they have a power of attorney? Does that does no, that help it? It still doesn't do anything. A power of attorney is only executing someone to sign on behalf, and that is. Very vague too, because there's a specific power of attorneys. Powers of attorney. I have a question. I, I'll get it. I'll get to it. Just one second. Give me just one moment. A power of attorney basically dies when the person who signed it dies. Okay, it dies with the person. Go ahead. Ask your question. Okay, so a will, but you can still do a will and have it pour over into the trust, right? Wills go through probate. Wills are con. Uh, so there's no will in the trust. <laughs> Give me a second. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, wills go through probate. Wills are instructions to a judge, a judge who's in probate court. A pour over will does say all my property pours into the trust, but you still have to go through that probate process to get it to do that. There's a lot of, um, it's actually, I'll just give you a scary story. There's actually an attorney in Marietta. I think she's doesn't do it this way anymore. But I had this debate with her. She's like, oh, there, there's, that's what the pour over will is for. I'm like, oh my goodness. No. You're like out here doing like estate planning. No, no. Like you still go through probate court. She's like, wait, what? I'm like, okay. So let me just give you some information. She, I, um, she's been practicing a few more years now. I don't think she does that anymore. But so it's a very common misconception. Wills go through probate court all day, every day. Just like what he was saying, it doesn't avoid it. It actually almost guarantees it. Was have the it's part of the entire estate plan right yeah, yeah. It, it is a tool because like what you were saying go ahead yeah now, now if you guys have if they have a trust and the properties are in the trust and the trust references the will then yeah that will is active that thing right. goes ahead but right. if i'm gonna say the other way where if it's a will and they're saying that it should be like in a trust but the properties aren't in the trust they have a trust, but they're actually not in the trust. That's probate. Yeah. All day. All day. So, wow. So like a parent has a property mm -hmm. and their their child is in the will. Yeah. They don't have it all set up in a trust. Yep. So yes. That. Yep. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. So or more. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, but this is, you guys, this, this is the reason I love doing this. I want to get this information. No, now you guys know, oh, that yeah. doesn't avoid it. Now let's do something better for our clients. Right. 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 All right. So here's an overview of the probate process. Okay. So I've been talking about probate, talking about probate. Um, now, what is that probate process? The very first thing we do is we file a petition for probate. About, I'd say 45 to 60 days later, I, I usually can get a hearing, usually in Riverside, but county, but I just filed one and it was almost three months later. So those um, timelines are actually getting a little pushed out. They're getting bogged down again. So, but at that first hearing, usually that's when I get an administrator or, you know, an executor appointed. A few days later, about two weeks later, I get what's called letters of administration. And you know, it's easy. After that, 
about four months later, we have to file that inventory I talked about, that inventory and appraisal. And, a, and within a year to two years after that, we have to file our final petition to distribute and close out the probate. And then I go back for yet another hearing. And that's about um, another two, three months, just give it depending on the court. And then about two weeks after that, then we can distribute everything. That's why this process takes so long. But the, the time period that you care about, what matters to you is when can we list and sell the house? So you can list the property about, about 60 to 75 days after we file the petition. Okay, whenever letters are granted, that's when you want to list the property. You don't have to wait till the very end of probate. You don't have to wait till it's completed, but you do have to wait until we have letters granted for a few yes. different reasons. Reason number one, you want to make sure you're signing with the right person. Make sure it's the person who's actually going to get appointed. Number two, I don't know what's going to happen at that hearing. I think it's going to go well, but is somebody going to step up and contest something? Is the judge, you know, uh, we, we say like, what is the judge going to do? I don't know. What do you have for breakfast that morning? We don't know what the judge is going to do. We think it's going to go well, but if it doesn't, now we're, it's um, pushed out even more. So don't actually, you know, I'm listen, I'm not going to get into whether you sign a listing agreement or not, but just don't make it live yet because nobody wants a stale listing. And then what's going to happen is you're like, Andrea, there was a hearing. What happened? I, I already went live. I got all these offers. I'm like, I know, but we are not going back to court for six more weeks. Ew. Don't do that. Stay in good contact with the probate attorney, figure out what's going on, but you just don't want to like start it and then have to be like, oops, just kidding. Can't really take an offer on that. Yeah. Okay. An easy way to go. <laughs> don't listen until you get you something. Don't scare me anytime. Oh, until you get a letter from her <laughs> to working with, that's kind of where I tell agents going, until you actually get an approval from the probate attorney saying, okay, it's go, you're, you're okay to sit there and list this property, then yeah. And, and then title can look at that and go, okay, we can move forward now. Right. So therefore it's, I mean, and then, because what if you guys what find a buyer? See? I, I will see the letter that she will sit there and give the, to the agent it's stating that you guys are allowed to sell this this property on behalf of so-and-so for this estate because I mean more than half the time there's other assets besides just this one house and the letter is from the court the, it's actually it's court authority it's basically I see it as the hall pass right this says hey everybody guess what I'm the one who can do this, you know, and so you want, you know, selly seller to be able to show and say, here you go. There you, there you have it. And again, I'm not, sign your agreement, sign everything. Just don't make it live until then. Oh. But everybody out there in TV land, make sure that you're muted. We're hearing all kinds of noises in the background here. So if you'll just take a second and do that, we'd really appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs> go ahead. And what are the dependencies of uh, closing uh, that property after you're allowed to lease? So let, what let are the dependencies? Let me keep on going. All right. All right. So there are two different ways that happen in a probate sale. One is when you don't need court confirmation and one, right? And when, what is when you do need court confirmation? Okay. So I'm going to talk about when you don't need court confirmation first. This is when the administrator has full authority. They, it is very similar to a normal listing. Similar, not same, similar. You have to use the probate addendum that goes with it. Okay, so there is an addendum, you've got to use it. And please list the administrator by their title. Okay, I see a lot of times, you know, Bob Smith doesn't own this property in my situation. Right. It was actually Fred Smith that owned it. And Bob Smith is just our administrator. Okay, so you've got to list that. If you have any, any, any questions, please ask the probate attorney. They're there to help you. So I just want to say, the way I see it is like, we're on the same team. Let's get this property sold quickly. Let's get it sold smoothly. Let's just have a great transaction and let's just work together. I'm going to tell you everything you need to know. You tell me everything I need to know. And let's just, you know, make sure that we work well together. That's how I like to um, handle those transactions. All right. Um, I will say when you have no court confirmation and a very important thing to know is 
once you have an accepted offer, you have to tell the probate attorney because they have to get out something called a notice of proposed action. <laughs> and here's the thing. Once we like, oh, okay, cool. Um, we have an accepted offer. Everybody's excited. We're just, you know, open escrow. We're going. I need to get out this notice and I have to give everybody I'm giving notice to 15 days. 15 days notice. So guess what? If you don't tell me in time, your escrow is getting pushed out because title's not going to let this close because they know I'm in probate and I need to have gotten out my, my notice of proposed action and given 15 days notice. Okay, go ahead. We had a situation, I don't know if I do we had 11 heirs and I hadn't sent that out. Thank Oops. God if someone still see that we're able to do an email and they all agree. Oh, thank goodness. Yeah, yeah. You just have to make sure that you do that, okay? The term of personal representative versus administrator, what are the differences there? There are legal differences. Sometimes it's, um, and I can explain them all. Don't get, don't get yourself, it, it all basically means the same thing. Okay. Okay. But it's important that I say, Bob Smith. First find, person. find out from the attorney. The attorney. Okay. What's their, their legal title? Okay. Yep. That's why you've got to work with the attorney. Right on. Okay. Okay. When you have court confirmation, this happens when one, you have limited authority, or there's another reason that the probate attorney has said we need court confirmation. Okay. There are times when we might have full authority, but there's some stuff going on in that probate and we're going to get this approved by the court for other reasons. This is very different than a, a normal listing. Yes, you still use the probate addendum, but um, it has to get published in the newspaper. It gets posted at the courthouse. The, your commission must be approved by the court and overbids are possible. So protect your buyer, okay? What do I mean by that? Basically, things get auctioned off, okay? It goes to an auction. Now, if nobody shows up to the auction, big deal. But if somebody shows up to an auction, it's literally like, okay, we have it listed at 500,000. That's what it's approved for. Do I have any overbids? Okay, you're gonna take it for 520. Great, thank you. Anyone else? I mean, literally the judge becomes an auctioneer. It's quite funny. Um, but that, so you have to protect your buyer. I've had plenty of situations where people are like, well, do I have to go to court for that court confirmation? Yeah, if you want to protect your buyer, you do. Well, you know, how likely is it that, a, you know, someone else is going to go and overbid? I don't know. I can't tell you that. Does it happen? Yeah. Is it going to happen now? I'm not sure. Let's go, find, let's go to court and find out, right? We got to be able to figure it out and find out. So protect your buyer. Um, is there a certain amount over though? Like, is it yeah. 25000 over? It, it, there's a formula and actually, I don't, I don't think I have it in this one. Um, I could explain it, but it's basically, it's a percentage of it's like 10% of the first 10,000 and 5% um, of their thereafter. And so there's a way to figure it out. Again, you're going to get that from the probate attorney because they have to complete it in the form that's actually filed with the court. Got it. Okay. When you need court confirmation, this process is going to take about at least about probably 90 days. Because again, we're, we're not only, okay, great, we have an accepted offer. Now the, the attorney has to fill out this um, request to have the court approve the sale. Then we have to go to a court hearing, which is going to be 45 to 60 days out. Then once that happens, then we'll have the court order on there, okay? And again, you're um, using the probate addendum and make sure that Bob Smith is listed in his official capacity, all right? Okay. All right, um, you're gonna, you have to accept the highest and best offer. I don't know what that is, that's your job. That's why you're the agent, right? You guys know what the highest and best, that's what you help the um, clients figure out. You gotta open the listing up to the open market, all right? Which means open it up on MLS. It, you know, even if it's like, oh my goodness, this is awesome. I have a buyer who's going to love this. You still got to open it up. Okay. You're not, um, don't, you can't shortcut it on, on probate listings. When you have to go to court confirmation, you also have to be aware of the 90% rule of the probate referee appraisal value. Meaning with that inventory and appraisal, 
right, that I talked about, I've been talking about inventory and appraisal. So there's a probate referee who is a court appointed appraiser. That court appointed appraiser puts a value on the property. Yes, you got to listen to their amount. No, I, 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 yes, I get it. You've been doing this for 30 years. You know the value. You can give evaluation. Doesn't matter. We still have to do the probate referee value. So if the probate referee says that this is $500,000, we have to sell it within at least 90% of that, or else we've got some explaining to do. Okay. And that's fine. We might be able to explain it. And, you know, I've, I've had situations where we've sold it for less and there's been pretty good reasons. We explain it, but just know that that's a general rule. If it is below, we've got to explain. So the probate referee, that's whether it's court confirmation or not, or is that just court? It gets appraised no matter what. Whether you have to comply with this, it's a big deal if you have to go to court confirmation. You know that notice of proposed action? So now let's say the property was valued at 500,000 and we sold it for $100,000. Why would we, but just go with me. And now your 11 heirs are like, what the heck are you doing? I'm now going to object to this. Now we're court confirmation. Now we have to comply. You have to explain why it's happening, okay? The other thing is like, what is their definition of accept highest and best offer compared to the probate referee appraisal? Because uh, maybe the best offer is like the highest offer is not the best offer per se, as far as the um, closure of the mortgage is concerned, because they're more likely not to appraise at that price. Would that consider like acceptable in this kind of scenario? So highest and best offer, I don't know what that is. That's your job. You're the agent. You're, you're there helping the client figure that out. I couldn't tell you. And they don't have a specific definition to highest and best. It's case by case. And then what kind of loop would a reverse mortgage throw into it? A reverse mortgage is, just, is pretty much just like any other mortgage, but you can't sit on it. What I see is people sit on it. Right. Mom died and they buried their head in the sand for six months. Well, in that time, guess what? The mortgage holder could come in and start foreclosure proceedings. We've been pretty good at getting the mortgage company. We just tell them like, hey, listen, we're going to start a probate. We'll keep you informed. And usually that keeps them at bay. But I just had one where, oh my goodness, oh, um, they sat on it for two years and they kept telling the mortgage company, okay, we're going to figure it out. We're going to do it. We're going to do it. Finally, they hired us and we're like, Okay, well, we'll reach out to them. Mortgage company's like, yeah, I heard that one before. We literally, I think we closed, I, I think it was about 10 days before the trustee sale, thankfully. But what do you think when you see the notice of foreclosure? Cha-ching, right? You're gonna, it gets messed up for the client. So you've got to make sure that you are um, doing it in time. So they did a forced sale because the person had died two years prior. No matter what, it was that house was getting sold. Right. With a reverse mortgage, they can foreclose upon it. If, if yeah, so they can foreclose upon it. Um, so how long do does on a reverse mortgage does the heirs have to sell the property and to make a decision before it hits? Before it hits I think it's six months. It's either 90 days or six months. It you have to notify them. It used to be 90 days, but they'll like send it out. I mean, but I've heard stories of three years. Wait, here's the thing. Squatting in the house, paying mom the bills, this and that. And because not all mortgage servicers will catch on. That's the right. thing. Right. It right. depends on what company they're with. They yeah, because they're not making a mortgage payment. But, but I mean, well, the reverse mortgage, guess what? And, it's just adding to it. And, right. thing is, yeah. and, and also, no, anytime there's a reverse mortgage, if the people lose it or the people die, People who are related, the kids get first bid if they want to buy that property. Right. The family of the person who's deceased or the one who's on the reverse mortgage always gets first option. And then you could sit there and sell it to whoever you guys want. Right. Yeah. And and so just because they can foreclose doesn't mean that they actually do. That's what I'm saying. Sometimes we can yeah. get them at bay and everything. Okay. So it's, it's not like an automatic thing. Right. Okay. All right. In case you're wondering, you need to get a certified um, copy of the order and certified copies of the letters. Don't worry, you can get this from the um, the attorney's office, but that's what escrow and title is going to need to close that transaction.
All right, more challenges. Just, um, these are some challenges in a probate sale. Unfortunately, a lot of times you have little um, access to funds for repairs, costs, um, maintenance, and you know improvements. Improvements might not be reimbursed from the from the court, especially if we have somebody who's challenging um, things that are happening. So make sure you're talking to the probate attorney to make sure you guys are on the same page with that. The personal representative has to. Um, adhere to the court standards for making decisions. What would a reasonable person do in this situation for the best interest of the probate beneficiaries? Um, and there's usually no help for cleanouts, junk removal, and stuff like that um, because you know you don't have the person who lived there there and doing it. So it makes it a very big challenge. So just understand that this is a challenge. And then one of the biggest ones is you're dealing with a grieving family. Okay. You can't underestimate the impact of that. You're, you're a lot of times dealing with a grieving family, and there's a lot that goes into that. All right. What does an agent pay for those things and add it to an escrow account, I mean, an escrow charge? Mm -hmm. Just yes. say, hey, clothing, you're going $2,000 going to the junk. Yep. We see it happen um, often. Okay. okay. Yep. All right. You've got to be flexible. Expect the unexpected. Go ahead. I was just saying, if you, if no one can pay for it, you could technically pay for it to get your guy to pay for it, and then just bill escrow. Yeah. I see it. Yeah, I see if that happened a lot. Yeah. Yep. All right. Um, expect the unexpected. Please work closely with the probate attorney. Again, you know, we're there for the same purpose, right? Get the transaction done. Best results for our clients. Um, you know, the more efficient, effective, and um, that we can get something done. I mean, don't we all like transactions like that? Probate attorneys are no different. We want the exact same thing. The way I see it is the better the agent does, the better that I look as well, right? Because we're, we're just getting it done. Um, when we're not in communication or not, you know, there's like fits and starts. No, it's not a, it's not a fun situation for anyone. All right. Also, nothing's final till it's final. A judge's order is the final thing. So you might close escrow. And a judge can unwind that. Oh, baby. Uh huh. That's why I know, right? Everybody's like, what the hell? Yeah, it's true. <laughs> it doesn't happen often, but that's why we um, just know until we have a court order that's basically blessed it, that says, okay, it's done, that's when it's actually finally done. All right. If I haven't said it before, make sure you work closely with the probate attorney. All right. Resources for your seller. Um, one is you. Your seller is talking to you for a reason. They're coming to you because they trust you. They believe that you can help them. Take the listing, right? If it's your first time going through a probate transaction, just let the probate attorney know. I know for me, I'm like, oh, cool. I used to, at the DA's office, um, I had to interview uh, witnesses all the time, especially law enforcement. So I'd be walking, we'd walk to court, we'd be talking, we'd be talking about like what we're going to, you know, how we're going to do things in, in court. And then I'm like, wait a second, like, have you, you've testified before, right? And they're like, no. I'm like, dude, we've just been talking for 10 minutes. Like, let me know. I can help you out. I'm like, okay. And then I'd have my spiel because I want him to look good on the stand because that makes me look good, right? right? If it's your first transaction through probate, Cool. Let me know. I'll just tell you like, hey, FYI, you got to do this. You got to do that. Don't forget that. The better you look, the better I look. That's how I see it. Take the listing. Um, great resources. Again, yourself, a probate attorney, an amazing title company. Again, you guys pull title early and often. That's how you're going to identify these things beforehand. Don't wait until three days before closing you got to know this beforehand and get this started because a lot of times we can avoid this stuff from becoming an issue. Okay, and make sure to reach out to us instead. Of, I know you guys all have the online accounts that you guys can pull property profiles and everything, but contact us because the deed that's showing on that isn't always the newest one that's vested. Yep. So there could be like first the initial buy a house and it's so-and-so as a married couple then all of a sudden they put together, they trust, or if one passed away and they, they redid a deed, there could be more deeds than just that one. So that's why email or call Julie and I, and we'll be able to sit there and pull every deed that is on the, the property. Just because I ran into that before we're going, it's so-and-so, and then all of a sudden it was really in a trust. Yep. So we, didn't, we were able to avoid everything. So that's the thing is make sure just to contact us and let us look just, just because those online companies i love them all but at the same time they don't give you every deed it's true i mean i see this happen a lot um you know our office you know we have access to those online things 
as well. No, no. We go and we, we email title as well. Like, hey, can you get me the most recent vesting deed on this? Who is this currently vested in? You've got to make sure. I'm telling you guys, listen, I practice what I preach. We do it ourselves. We pull title early and often as well. All right. Um, one question. Who's your Please. favorite title company? Uh, <laughs> if you can Stop. tell us. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Um, an estate sale company, um, a moving company, a cleaning company, a trash removal company, as well as contractors for repairs. How you, you, this is generally your team that you have already, right? That these are resources for your sellers. It's the same thing. You're going to need these resources for the um, probate sales as well. All right. After closing, encourage proper estate planning. I know that we've taken a lot of time. So how are we doing with time? I was going to explain um, probate. 10 minutes. All right. I'm going to go fast. So, you know, just for the next like um, seven minutes, I'm not going to take questions because I'm going to get through this. Okay. All right. We got to avoid probate. This is how you can help your, your clients post-closing. Okay. This is how we add more value to our clients. We tell them about it. So we talked a little bit about the difference between a will and a trust. Okay. As I said, a will goes through probate. It includes instructions to a judge. That's why you hear about trust. A trust can completely avoid that probate process. That's why it is. And as you see, assets are now titled in the name of that trust. That's how it gets that secret sauce. That's the secret sauce that makes a trust work is how assets are titled, how the home specifically is titled. All right, a properly drafted, properly funded trust can completely avoid that probate process. That's what you have to tell the clients so they understand and they know, like, listen, you great, we just closed this transaction. Congratulations, you have a beautiful home. I noticed you took, you know, title as individuals. You really should look to get it, um, to put that into a trust. Um, also, a trust can only control trust property, all right? So think of all of your assets. You got your house, you got bank accounts, your car, your stuff. A trust can only tr control trust property. You have to fund your trust. So what do we do when we get a, a property? We get that grant deed. Well, when we transfer assets into a trust, we have, a tr we have to have a trust transfer deed, actually transferring it from you know, Dan Smith and Jane Smith, husband and wife, to Jan Smith and Dan, Dan Smith, trustees of the Smith Family Trust. This has to occur and be recorded and be the most recent vesting deed. If not, it is not in that trust. I don't care what the trust says. I don't care if there's a schedule of assets that lists the house there. If this is not the most re recent vesting deed, it ain't in the trust, we're in probate court. All right, what happens when you don't fund your trust? Probate court. Okay, it's very important to let clients know and make sure that they do this. And also, this is information for yourselves. For those of you who have trust, make sure, you know what? Ask Julie to, or Eric to pull up title to your house. Like, hey, I got a refinance. Is it still in my trust or not? Make sure you get this checked out for yourself. I'll just take a moment to speak about DIY planning. There are so many websites out there that really give us this false sense of security and this you know, gives us this aura of protection as if we can go onto one of these websites, fill in a few boxes, then press print, and now bada bing, bada boom, yeah, got yourself a trust. I'm sorry, there's just a little too much at stake. It's our kids, it's our property, it's our home, it's our legacy, right? There's too much at stake to trust one of these um, things. It's kind of like, what was that? Um, online like is it purple bricks or uh, something yeah right a few years ago right yeah, yeah. oh as if that's a replacement um excuse me no right we all know and experience that when you guys saw that which you're like oh my gosh know. you guys don't even know what we do right that's the service you know and that's service advice and how much better are are your clients working with you than some online thing it's the same thing with this. There is no replacement. You can't let your clients fall prey to it. I feel so blessed when I'm able to help clients before it's too late. When it's too late, it's awful what happens to families. People don't know how bad it is until it's too late. Friends don't let friends do DIY planning, okay? <laughs> don't let your friends fall prey to this. Wait just a second. Sure. So, and actually, I'm going to skip this part of it. I had a thing where we were going to figure out uh, when, um, what your probate fees were going to be, but I think I have about five, four minutes left. So 
When do you need a trust? You need a trust when you own any real property, when you have minor children, you guys with minor children, I'll just get it. I'll take a, a few minutes, um, a minute. When children inherit property, minor children, they cannot own property and it goes into a guardianship. When a guardianship is in place, a court is supervising their money. A child's money cannot be spent. A court will not allow it to be spent on that child's clothing, food, or shelter. So think about that life insurance policy and you have your minor children listed as a beneficiary that goes into a guardianship and cannot be used for their clothing, food, or shelter. It's super backwards, you guys. The way to avoid it is with a trust. Now you list a trust as the beneficiary of that life insurance policy. And you say, uh, yeah, let my kids, you know, get, buy them a meal, you know, clothe them, let them uh, be supported. You know, let's pay for them to have somewhere to live. That's what the life insurance is for. Um, so if you have minor children, you've got to have a trust. This is not just for people who are like in their 70s and 80s and 90s, okay? This is for us who are young. We have families. We have people. We have someone or something we want to protect. All right. If you have more than $184,500 of assets, you have a blended family. Do you know what I mean by blended family? We got his kids. We got her kids. We got our kids. It's the Brady Bunch, right? When we have the Brady Bunch, we have to have a trust. If not one of those kids will likely accidentally get disinherited. It will be unintentional. Think about it this way, husband and wife. Husband has a son and wife has a daughter. Well, let's just say wife doesn't have any children, right? Husband and wife die. If husband passes away, everything will go to wife. Son of husband is not wife's natural heir. Right. When wife passes away, son doesn't get anything. This happens all the time. That's how son accidentally just got disinherited. Don't let this happen to yourselves. Don't let this happen to your clients. It happens every day. Or you own a business. Business owner, this is the last one. Business owner has, um, need to make sure that they're protected. I have yet to see a business survive probate court intact. Okay, Probate court can't operate fast enough. All right, it's important that we plan today so that we do have peace of mind tomorrow. It's up to us for ourselves, our family, but also for our clients. Um, Stuart Title, because Jamie and, and or, I'm sorry, Julie and Eric are so amazing. They actually um, set up a card for you guys where for your clients, for a transaction that you close using Stuart Title and their team, it actually comes with $300 towards an estate plan with our office, oh, wow. which is amazing benefit. So they care about you guys and they care about your clients. So there is um, a postcard that you received. Give this to your clients. There's actually a special page that they go on, um, on for our website so that they can sign up for this. You can physically give this to them and they also have a digital version of this so that, and they can email it out to you. Again, it, if any transaction that you have that closes using them, then you, your clients get $300 off through an estate plan. And the last thing I'm just going to say is, um, hopefully, has this been helpful? Yes. Did you learn something? Okay. You learned something, right? I love being able to give this information, but I also would make available a presentation, basically a pre personalized presentation to your clients. So whoever wants to provide this value to their clients, we only do one of those a month. So you got to let us know, actually let um, Katina know that you're interested in doing that. And we'll get that set up. Um, she's up here, up here in the front. I know, I'm sorry, like, I hear you. <laughs> but um, just let us know and we'll get that scheduled. And it's for your clients and have them bring a friend. So it's a way to stay top of mind and provide value to your clients. Again, always adding value to them and helping them out and then have them bring a friend because that adds value to you. So that's what I got. And that's our information. Okay. All right. All right. Thank you. I went over. I apologize. Thank you. Thank you. And um, Andrea and her team are actually the ones that went through all the effort to put these together. So thank you so much. And what a great way to reach out to your past uh, clientele, right? Reach out to them, just check in, do your care calls, make sure everything's going well and just say, Hey, uh, I remember your property wasn't a trust. Uh, did you refinance? Is it back in the trust? Okay, great. Oh, you still haven't put in a trust yet? Well, I have a great um, attorney I can get you in touch with. Hang on to these, grab a couple. I'll be sending out a digital version for all of our online uh, watchers. 
And then if you have any questions, Andrea's contact info is on here. Um, I'm going to be sending out my contact information as well. So again, thank you all. And uh, I look forward to our next one. Oh, this is a good question. I don't know if they recorded it. Oh, I think I don't yeah. know. It was, it has been recorded. You have to get you to sign some things. <laughs> I'll email you. <laughs> All right, well, thank you everyone for joining us. We'll see you next time. Thank you.